Hey guys, Max here, and this is your daily market update for yesterday, the 21st of June, of course. Um, as you can see, actually equities performed really quite well for the most part. Uh, one notable exception there seems to be Meta or Facebook. And the reason for that seems to be quite simple. They've basically just announced they're extending a policy for one extra year where they're not going to take any revenues from their creators. Uh, the way YouTube works, for instance, is they take 45% of the ad revenue that a creator uh, generates and Facebook have just said they're not going to do that for another year so this is just delaying a little bit of revenue for Facebook and so uh, investors are a little bit unhappy and they're having to readjust their earnings forecast because of that reason. Other than that though everything is up across the board as you can see green everywhere. Uh, big tech was nice and healthy with you know three four five percent gains across the board. Consumer defenses were healthy. Energy stocks were healthy. Literally every single sector actually rose for the day it was really quite a strong rally. The S&P 500 rose by about 2.5% by the end of the day, and the Nasdaq rose by 2.5% as well. The Dow Jones did a little bit worse, but was still strong at 2.2%. And then the Russell 2000 did lag a fair bit, rising by 1.7%. Now, as for the rest of the world, it was, again, the same sort of situation. Green across the board with a decent rally in uh, most markets. The uh, FTSE 100 rose by about 0.4%. The stock 600 rose by about 0.3%. And then on the whole, the MSCI World Index rose by 1.1%. As you can see, Asia strong, Europe strong, America was strong. Every market in the world yesterday did well. Now, the dollar strengthened very slightly against its peers. Its spot index rose by about 0.2%. The pound is currently at $1.22, so right around where it has been for what feels like months now. The euro is in that same boat, sitting at $1.05, so no real changes there. And then the yen was actually slightly up to 136 yen per dollar. As for bonds, there wasn't really any massive volatility, which is nice to see for once. Uh, the US 10-year Treasury yield rose by four basis points and now sits at 3.24%. Uh, it does now seem that uh, the 10-year Treasury is sitting happily above that 3% mark. There is no more resistance there. It's been thoroughly broken. And it feels like the new resting level of the 10-year Treasury yield is a few dozen basis points above 3%. Now, as for oil prices, we actually had some more good news with oil prices falling for the most part. Uh, WTI crude oil is currently sitting at about $105 a barrel, which is a really nice low looking level. Of course, if you go back six months, it would have looked terrifyingly high. But compared to the $120 we were sitting at last week, it's quite nice to see. Brent crude is a fair bit higher at $110 a barrel. But unfortunately, I really don't think this is actually good news for the long term. Uh, again, this is based on speculation about a global recession, about reduced oil demand in the future. So it's hardly anything to be that excited about. As for gold prices, well, they fell slightly, but they're still sitting just above $1,800 at $1,825 an ounce. Uh, that seems to be their level of resistance as well. Finally, then, what happened in the world of crypto? Well, it was slightly bad, but nothing awful. Bitcoin lost that $21,000 mark and is back down to $20,000. Ethereum uh, did the same. It was sitting close to $1,200 and it's now closer to $1,100. And most altcoins fell somewhere in the region of 10% for the day. Now, there wasn't actually any specific major news that caused uh, this uh, turnaround for the crypto markets. There were a few bits of news, but really nothing too major. The first is that Tether, uh, USDT, that company that you know, you know manages the largest stablecoin in the world and is tipped to be a massive fraud and on the edge of collapse. Well, they've announced that they're going to have a full audit with a very reputable firm and that that will put away all fears about how they're backed. And that will be really good for the crypto industry if that comes to fruition. Yeah, it would be really good for the crypto industry if it comes to fruition, it's not going to happen. That's what I'm saying. If it does happen, we are five or 10 years away from that. Uh, this article here is about four years old at this point, And this was what happened the last time that Tether uh, announced that they were going to have an independent audit. They ended up canceling it halfway through because the auditors were asking too many questions. Um, that is obviously not a good thing to hear. Uh, Tether is still the same organization. I strongly suspect that nothing has changed. They are very risky reportedly with Chinese commercial papers. 
uh, bonds coming from individual companies in China, in particular in the collapsing real estate segment. So no, uh, I really don't see this as much good news. I see it as Tether just trying to pull the wool over more people's eyes. Frankly, their fraud is incredibly well documented. They've been fined tens of millions of dollars in the past by the US Justice uh, Department of Justice, for instance. Um, so just don't use USDT. It's too risky an asset. Now, there is actually some other news out of Tether, and that's the fact that they're going to be creating a Great British uh, Pound Tether. So a GBPT, basically a stablecoin pegged to the British Pound which is actually really annoying because that would be really useful if it came from a reputable firm uh, like the firm which puts out USDC, but it's Tether. Uh, I would actually really quite like to have a bigger British stablecoin. We have a TGBP, but it's quite a small and niche stablecoin. It doesn't get much use. And so trading pairs are pretty poor. This will probably have far better prices and things, but of course I don't trust Tether. So it's not like I'm ever going to use it. Now, we also got some news coming out of Huobi, which is a Chinese uh, or used to be a Chinese based crypto brokerage exchange, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they've had a little bit of controversy recently as well. And in particular, around one of their ex senior managers who it's just come out has been accused of uh, basically stealing money from the company and trading with it and making himself some money. Now, what exactly did he do? Well, he set up fraudulent accounts in the names of uh, other people, notably his dad. And then he used his position at that firm to give that account uh, millions and millions of dollars of USDT, funnily enough. And then he traded with it. And uh, somehow he actually made a profit and came out on top. So he probably thought he got away with it. But what he did was still incredibly illegal and just a massive indictment of the state of the crypto industry at the moment. Unfortunately, it is absolutely rampant with fraud like this on an everyday basis. Huobi is itself actually a slightly dodgy exchange. It's not the worst one out there, but I certainly don't trust it. Um, it had trouble with China in the first place because obviously China and the Communist Party is very anti-crypto. And that's where this exchange originated. It's now based out of the seashells. And so obviously regulating uh, crypto exchanges isn't a major concern for the seashells because they're a tax haven for a reason. Um, this is bad news for the market, but again, it isn't really market killing. I strongly doubt this had any serious effect over the crypto market's fall over the last day. Now, of course, the uh, equity market rose for the day, as we discussed just a moment ago. So why did it rise? Was there loads of good news coming out of our economies? Was there a fall in inflation in first world nations? Was there something positive to actually cause this market boom? Well, no, of course not. Actually, there was some negative news. Um, frankly, when you see gains of two and a half percent in a single day in the middle of what is one of the worst bear markets in living memory, those gains usually don't last for very long at all. They tend to be bull traps. And that's what I strongly suspect this one here is. As I just said, we did actually get bad news out uh, for the markets in general, in particular out from the UK. We got new uh, CPI inflation data and it came out at 9.1% uh, year over year figure, which is pretty damn awful. Um, it was expected to be awful in fairness, which is why the markets aren't really panicking on this. It was pretty much where analysts were expecting to see this inflation level, but it's still the worst we've had in the UK in 40 years. It mostly comes from a surge in natural gas prices in electricity and energy in general, and then petrol and diesel for fueling our cars. Now, don't get me wrong, this is by no means good news. It means that actually uh, the Bank of England is probably going to have to start doing 50 basis point rate hikes, which frankly they should have been doing about two months ago now. It means that people's disposable incomes and their savings are going to get eroded away and consumers are going to be weaker. And yes, this is basically why everyone's predicting a recession in the UK. Of course, it's pretty much the exact same situation across the pond in Europe. And it's an incredibly similar situation over in the US as well, just with a slightly uh, lesser increase in energy prices. Now, this being the UK and of course, most mainstream media outlets being incredibly neoliberal like uh, Bloomberg. Well, they are trying to paint this as a problem of Brexit. If you go on Bloomberg, you'll read loads about how this is Brexit uh, fault. And in reality, there's no basis for that at all. Uh, inflation in Europe, in the rest of the continent is as bad, if not worse than in the UK. For example, food prices were something that we were told would absolutely spike and explode if uh, Brexit happened. Well, Brexit then happened and food price inflation in the UK is lower than almost every European country right now. So yeah, that line of argument really doesn't line up. 
The reason for this inflation is 100% clear. It was gross, irresponsible monetary and fiscal policy in the United Kingdom by this Conservative government. Uh, the exact same sort of gross monetary and fiscal policy that we saw in the US and in the rest of Europe as well. Now, the reality is that actually uh, this inflation is probably going to keep going a bit higher. We're probably going to see 10%, maybe even 11% CPI before it actually does start to slow down. This is already being seen by some as a slowdown because month over month, this figure was only 0.7%, uh, whereas the month before it was 2.5%. Frankly, that doesn't reassure me much at all. Now, the rest of the UK is uh, struggling for other reasons. We have a massive train strike going on at the moment. There's a big problem with uh, the, the train drivers union or whatever you want to call them. I can't remember their official name uh, coming out and grinding the country to a halt. As someone who lives in London, yeah, it's pretty damn annoying. Uh, this all seems awfully similar to the 1980s or 70s. Uh, it seems like we're entering a new Cold War with uh, Russia and with China. We have massive strikes going all over the place and a massive unionizing movement as well. We have huge inflation and probably stagflation for the next couple of decades. The similarities are really quite weird right now. Now, regarding the train strikes, very briefly, um, I'll just give you my opinion on it. Frankly, I think that actually, yeah, those train drivers have a right to strike. Um, I also think that Transport for London or, uh, you know, any other train operator in the world also has the right to automate train driving and cut these people out. That's simple capitalism at work. Frankly, there are automated trains in countries like France and Germany and China and Japan and a myriad of other places. There's no reason why they can't be here in the UK. And when a union pushes too hard, like I think they are here, there's a lot of negative sentiment regarding these strikes. Well, the simple answer is just to outsource the, these kind of jobs. Um, historically, that would have been done to other countries. Nowadays, that means outsourcing it to technology. Now, we got a little bit of news coming out of DocuSign, which is um, one of the companies that I have given an awful lot of stick to recently. And for good reason, I want to make that clear. Um, basically, the CEO, Dan Springer, he has decided to resign and jump ship and just avoid this, uh, this steaming pile of crap. Now, as I said, I give DocuSign an awful lot of uh, stick, especially on this channel, uh, but I do think it's perfectly justified. I think it, it was uh, the perfect encapsulation of this capital fueled tech boom where some silly people convinced themselves that this was some groundbreaking company that's going to change the way the world lives. The simple fact is that DocuSign has some very basic software. It allows you to digitize contracts and sign them and makes it easy. The problem is there are literally 100 other companies running the exact same sort of software and there's virtually no difference between the softwares. I've used a bunch of different ones myself and these companies and venture capitalists and people like Kathy Wood, well, they convinced themselves that actually this industry was here to stay, that they're making loads of money right now and that they're still growing at a pretty incredible rate right now. So it's an example of innovation growing and being valued appropriately. The problem is that when uh, this capital dries up, once this market becomes saturated, because to be clear, they are still growing at this point because there are still loads of companies out there which don't use this sort of digital software. But in five years, in 10 years, every company in the first world will have chosen a, uh, a provider of this software and suddenly there will be no more growth. And because there's no moat in between these companies, because there is no comparative advantage between them, the only way to compete with each other will be to cut prices. We'll see their revenues collapse off a cliff. We'll see their margins disappear into nothing. And 95% of these companies will die. And DocuSign will not be this marvel of SAAS companies that just prints money. The fact that the CEO is leaving uh, during a downturn is not a good sign, of course. He is unable to improve the state of the company. He knows that. He doesn't really want to deal with the flack as it continues to uh, flounder. So he's deciding to jump ship. The stock is already down 80%. It's predicting bad earnings reports in the future. And so I can only imagine it's just going to get worse. Now, the final thing we're going to talk about for this video is that Switzerland has started importing Russian gold once more. Now, this isn't a massive amount. It's about three tons, which sounds like a lot to you and me, and it is. But this is about 2% of uh, what Switzerland has imported for this month. So it isn't anything major, but it does show a shift in the way that Switzerland is uh, trying to go about business. Now, of course, Switzerland has historically been incredibly neutral, but they broke that neutrality when Russia invaded Ukraine and they sided with the West. Now, this wasn't a particularly surprising 
uh, event if you paid attention to what was happening because there was so much pressure being placed on European countries by everyone else in Europe and the US and Canada and UK and things like that. So it wasn't too surprising to see them side with the, the countries which actually give them the vast majority of their business. But we are now seeing uh, Switzerland start to erode back away on that. They're probably just trying to return to the status quo. They want to do business with everyone. That's always been their case. And this does represent a, a greater shift in the politics of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where you either have people who really care about it and really want to stand up to it and ensure that you know Russia isn't successful or ensure it doesn't happen again. And then you have those who don't really care and sort of just want to get on with their lives and continue making money. Switzerland is obviously in the latter half of that camp. East Europe in general is very much anti-Russia. They are very much aware of what Russian imperialism looks like. They saw an awful lot of it throughout the 20th century and they don't want to return to that area. West Europe is less so. The threat is a little bit less direct, so they're a little bit more lenient. And then over in America, well, you're even further away from Eastern Europe and from Russia. So there's a, an even greater idea that actually a lot of people just don't really care what Russia do and they just want to let them do their thing. The problem with this is that it's tearing the West into two separate halves that really can't seem to agree on this and it's only going to get worse uh, when we enter winter in particular in Europe and gas prices continue to spike as Russia continues to cut off gas supply and the EU continues to sanction Russia. Well, I think we're really going to see tensions grow between countries that should be allies, between Germany and the UK, for example, between Poland and Italy. Things are going to get a little bit messy, and so that's something to look out for. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to bless the YouTube algorithm. It really does help. If you want to join our exclusive community, then check out our Patreon. You get access to our Discord server and extra content like access to my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for all my own investments. Also, make sure to check out the link in the description to Masterworks. It can help you protect your portfolio against market turmoil through fractional shares of art from world-famous artists. Art has historically proven to be uncorrelated to the markets, so it's a really valuable resource with the markets falling every week. There's also a link in the description to iTrust Capital, which helps you to invest in crypto through your tax-advantaged IRA, which could literally save you thousands. If you, like me, think crypto going down is a buy-in opportunity, then now is the perfect time to join iTrust Capital. Thank you all for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.